Алу а, в контексте сопринга и в контексте построения микросервиса. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome, my name is Jesper de Jong. I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm going to tell you a bit about microservices with Scala and Spring. And um, I saw this morning there was already a, a talk about uh, microservices. Uh, so I'm not going to go into really a lot of detail about what microservices are because I want to spend most, most of the time on the demo. I'll tell you a little bit about Spring Cloud. And uh, then the presentation before here by uh, Vladimir, uh, he told a lot about Spring Boot and Spring Data REST and Spring Data JPA. So uh, I hope you know a little bit about Spring Boot, otherwise it might seem like it's going really fast. And uh, of course my uh, examples will be in Scala. And uh, it's pretty simple Scala, so if you, even if you don't know Scala, I hope you can uh, follow it. Okay, so first a little bit about microservices. Uh, people often compare microservices to, uh, to the, the monolith software architecture, which is the traditional software architecture that many web applications have, in, uh, especially in Java, where you have one project which has one database and you put all your code in one big project and uh, that's your web application. And this architecture has a number of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the traditional architecture, well, it's a single code base, so that can be an advantage because everything that, that's in the project you can find in your one code base. And uh, it, it's probably split up into multiple modules if it's a bigger web application. And uh, but calls from one module to another one are quite efficient in, in, in a monolithic application because everything runs in one JVM. So a call from one module to another module is just an in-JVM method call. It's also quite simple to deploy a monolithic application because normally you compile it into one WAR file which you deploy in Tomcat or another, another Java EE application server and you start it up and that's it. And scaling is also quite simple because you just have another server with another copy of your web application, for example, and you put a load balancer in front of it, and then uh, that way you can scale your application. But there are also a number of disadvantages. Um, when your web application gets large, it can become really complex, and modules are not very well encapsulated, which is especially true on the JVM, where everything ends up in the class path. And of course, you have to be careful that one module, for example, only calls the public API of another module, but the JVM doesn't have any protection against that. So you can, for example, by accident call an, a method in another module that was supposed to be internal. And if you don't watch out, it can become, become a big ball of spaghetti. And um, also one major uh, disadvantage is that it's hard to do updates in, an, in a monolithic application because most of the time that means you have to make a new version of your whole application and then stop the server and update the software and restart the server, which means you will have downtime and, uh, and people then tend to uh, accumulate changes and if you then for example once every six months do an update then there is a lot of risk because you have a lot of changes in one go and uh, that can be risky. So one of the things that, the, that you've heard a lot in the past two years uh, is uh, the microservices architecture. And uh, if you've been to more conferences, you will have noticed that everybody is talking about microservices. And uh, this is an idea that started with, for example, Netflix and Amazon and other companies in the US a few years back. And the idea was to split up the system into small independent services. And especially the word independent is important here. Uh, those services communicate with each other over the network, so uh, through well-defined APIs. So each of your services, for example, has a 
REST API and the services talk together via these REST APIs. And uh, one of the major advantages of this is if that you can deploy them and develop them independently of each other. So um, uh, if you have a, a system that consists of lots of microservices, then you can have many people working independently on each of those services and compare that to a monolithic uh, uh, application. If you have many people working on one code base, then it's going to be really hard to keep up to date with the changes that everybody makes to the same code base. So if you have independent services that you have can have small teams of people work on one service, it's much easier to work with lots of people on the whole system because they can each work on only a small part of the system. So here are some of the advantages. I already mentioned some of them. Um, there are also a number of challenges when you go uh, to microservices. Uh, one of the things is that you are then, if you are building a microservices application, you are really building a distributed system and there are lots of complicated things that come with that. Uh, for example, if you want to do transactions, uh, distributed transactions are really hard and also not very scalable. So uh, there are other things that you can, that are better to do instead of trying to do distributed transactions. Uh, also, calls from one service to the other are across the network and a network call is of course a lot, s a lot slower and less re reliable than an in method uh, or an in JVM method call. So those are things you have to think about. Also managing and uh, uh, deploying and uh, monitoring a system that consists of lots of microservices can be harder because if you have lots of service serv servers with lots of microservices running everywhere and they are all, for example, uh, spitting out log messages, then somehow you want to, to get all those log messages in one place uh, where, uh, so that you can monitor what the system is doing, which is a lot more complicated than when you just had one application that puts log messages in one file. Okay, that was my super quick introduction to microservices. And uh, if you want to know more, there are lots of uh, talks you can find on YouTube, for example, that go into much more detail. Also, I like this book by Sam Newman, Sam Newman about microservices. And this website is also interesting. It has a lot of definitions about, um, about the patterns and the terminology that have to do with microservices. Okay, then Spring Cloud. Uh, Spring Cloud is built upon Spring Boot, and I hope you know a little bit about Spring Boot. And if you don't, it's definitely worth having a look at it because Spring Boot makes it really easy to make standalone Spring applications and also web applications. And um, normally, what you do when you build a web application in Java is you build a WAR file and you deploy that WAR file in Tomcat, for example. But with Spring Boot, it works the other way around. So Spring Boot, with Spring Boot, you make a regular jar file, and then you start your jar file with just with Java minus jar. And then Tomcat is embedded inside your uh, uh, Spring Boot application. So instead of your application running in Tomcat, Tomcat is running inside the application. And um, Spring, when you compile a Spring Boot application, you get a, a so-called fat jar file, which is a jar file that contains all the dependencies, and that makes it really easy to, uh, to uh, deploy your Spring Boot application, because the only thing you have to do is copy your jar file to a server, and then you can just start it there with java minus jar myapp.jar. And then we have Spring Cloud, which is built on top of Spring Boot, and that offers a lot of tools for building microservices. And especially Spring Cloud uh, uh, adds integration with uh, uh, the, the microservices tools that Netflix has made. So Netflix has a whole range of open source uh, tools for microservices. 
and I'll show you some of them in the demo here so that you get an idea of what you can do with all of them. So let's go to the demo. I'm going to sit down for that. Um, I think I have to stop PowerPoint. Okay. There it is. So we are first going to um, build a small microservice, which is just a simple Spring Boot application. And uh, if you've seen uh, Vladimir's talk just now, it will uh, look familiar because it's uh, also using Spring Data JPA and Spring Data REST. So, oh yes, one thing I wanted to show you is if you want to start building a, a Spring Boot application, one of the best places to start is uh, start.spring.io. Uh, it doesn't work at this moment, but because I have no internet connection here, but uh, what you can do there is you can uh, just uh, click together a number of dependencies that you want in your Spring Boot application, and then there's a button to generate a Maven or Gradle project, which will contain uh, your Spring Boot application. And this whiteboard service, uh, I generated it also with that, and I added a number of things. So it has the Spring Boot parent POM, and then JPA is an, an API that's really uh, invented for Java, so it expects your entity classes to look like Java beans with getter and setter methods. So as you can see, this is not really idiomatic Scala. If it were really idiomatic Scala, 
we would rather use uh, an immutable case class for this. But uh, if you want to do JPA, well, then you have to do it uh, uh, the Java way. And then we have a node repository here, which is our... Uh, then every time you deploy your microservice on, an, on another server, it would be really cumbersome if you have to configure your service on every server where you deploy it. So one of the things that you'll want to do is get the configuration in one place. And uh, Spring, Date, uh, Spring Cloud has uh, an, an interesting uh, feature for that, which is the configuration service. So I've now added a config service, which is just another microservice. for my other microservices and it does that by looking up uh, configuration files in a git repository so if i look at the application property 
uh, client to this uh, whiteboard service and Spring Boot will automatically find it and then it will try to get the configuration from the config server instead of from its local configuration file. that consists of lots of different microservices, uh, you want those services to work together. So one of the servers has to be able to find other services so it can call them. And um, of course, you don't want to hard code in one service where another service is living. So what you'll want to have is a, uh, a registry in which services will register themselves and then other services or client applications will ask the registry where this service is that they want to call. And um, for that, uh, Netflix has a tool called Eureka. And uh, Spring Cloud su has support for Eureka. And it also has support for different other implementations of discovery services. But for this demo, I'm going to use Eureka. So I have another uh, little Spring Boot application here, this discovery service. And it's actually just as simple as the config service that we saw. So it's again a really simple Spring Boot application with a few lines of code. And I added another. 
itself with the with the Eureka server when it starts up. So I can now start my whiteboard service again. Okay, it's running. And if I then look at the status page, So we now have our whiteboard microservice, and we have the configuration service, and we have the Eureka discovery service. And in the next step, we are going to add a yeah, it's REST API. So in this step, I added another uh, Spring Boot application, Whiteboard Client. And this is a small web application which has some HTML pages and uh, CSS and JavaScript. And let's have a look at the... service and then I have a, uh, a controller which we'll have a look at in a moment let's first start it up and see Okay, and then I start. Okay, it's running. And uh, uh, put a node in the database or fetch the nodes from the database. So we can have a look at how it does this. Uh, it's using a standard REST. 
So the next, in the next step of the demo, we are going to have a look at another um, uh, Netflix component, which is called Ribbon. And Ribbon is, an, uh, is a client-side load balancing tool. So what Ribbon does for you is it looks up the service in Eureka, and then if there are multiple instances of your service, it will do load balancing, but it will do load balancing on the client side. So uh, you don't have to have a, a special load balancer device or something like that in your network. You can do the load balancing in the client, which is a lot more flexible. And let's have a look at how that looks. So Okay, so in the next step, I ad added another uh, Netflix component, which is called Fain. And what that does is uh, it makes it uh, simpler to call REST web services. Because um, what Fain does is it allows you to make a, a declarative REST web service uh, client. So it works similar to how Spring Data JPA works. If you create a, a repository interface there, the only thing you have to do is declare this interface and, and declare some methods in it, and then Spring Data JPA automatically generates the implementation of that interface. And what Fain does is exactly the same kind of thing. So I have here a whiteboard client. go on to the last step which is very interesting 
Um, one of the uh, patterns that you will encounter when you start working with microservices is the, uh, the circuit breaker pattern. So I'll explain what it is briefly. So if you have a whole a system that consists of a lot of microservices that call each other, etc., uh, then things can go wrong, of course. You might have uh, a microservice somewhere deep in the system that has some problem and it doesn't respond anymore. And um, that can lead to cascading failure problems. So if your client makes a request and it does a call to a microservices, which call another service, which calls another service, and somewhere deep down something goes wrong, then this error message has to be propagated through all this whole chain of services. And if you have, a lot, if you have lots of people uh, using uh, the system at once, then you can get a storm of error messages going through your network and you want to prevent that uh, by catching errors uh, at the front of your system. So this is where the circuit breaker pattern comes in. It's just like uh, a circuit breaker that you might have in your house if, if there's going to, for example, too much current through your electrical system in your house, then the circuit breaker opens and it prevents uh, more problems in the, your electrical grid in your house, for example. And uh, the circuit breaker pattern with microservices is something similar. So that means in your uh, client application, you add this component which monitors uh, your microservices. And if, if too many errors occur at a certain point, then the circuit goes open. And then for a certain amount, amount of time, for example, uh, it will fail. Uh, it will fail fast. So if if a hundred people uh, uh, do calls at the same time, and uh, and the, the circuit breaker notices that there's something wrong, and it goes open, then it will immediately reject those requests instead of trying to uh, push all the requests through your whole microservices uh, 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 network making everything slow down and, uh, and, and fail uh, in a more, uh, in a harder way. So um, one of the components, uh, uh, Netflix also has a component for the circuit, circuit breaker pattern and that's called the Hystrix. And I've now added that.
and now we get the fallback response. And one other interesting thing is that there's also a, a breaker just doesn't open immediately when there's one failure it has a certain threshold so if I in this whiteboard service if I refresh it quickly a few times for example I refresh it ten times or so then after a while the circuit Just in, in Eureka again, but if I now retry it, it works again. And if you look here, we can see that the circuit has closed again. So that was uh, what I wanted to show you for the demo. So I have a few more slides to wrap up. Uh, okay. Okay, so in the demo we saw the following steps. I first made a small uh, uh, Spring Boot microservice, the whiteboard service. Then we added the configuration service and the discovery service. And then we added this small uh, client application, which looks up the whiteboard service through the discovery service. Then we added client-side load balancing with the ribbon and a declarative REST uh, uh, client using Fane. And then we had the circuit breaker using Hystrix. And of course, I just showed you the surface of what's possible. And besides Ribbon, Fane, and Hystrix, and Eureka, there are lots of more components uh, that you can use. And there are many ways in which you can configure these uh, things, uh, but uh, which I didn't show you in this short demo. A little bit about using Scala with Spring Cloud. Uh, as you saw, it was uh, not very hard to use Scala for this instead of Java, because uh, Scala runs on the JVM, and it has very good interoperability with Java. So uh, everything that you can do in Java, you can also do in Scala. But there are a few things that can become a little bit ugly, like these annotations, uh, which are not as smooth as in a normal Java. And uh, also, some of the things are really made for Java, such as JPA, it's really a Java API. So what you end up doing is really writing, uh, uh, you, you are writing in Scala, but you're, what you're really doing is writing Java with a different syntax. Uh, so one idea uh, would be to investigate how it would work together with Akka. Akka is a... a, a, a 
a, fr a framework for distributed computing which is mainly built uh, for Scala. And uh, I think it would be an interesting idea to see how well that would work together with Spring Cloud because then you could have the good parts of Spring Cloud, which is the integration with all the, the Netflix tools. Uh, and you could also do it in a much more Scala-like, uh, uh, Scala-native approach if you use Akka. Okay. Uh, there's, of course, a lot more to find on the web about this. Uh, you can find the code for my demo, including all the steps and a description on uh, my GitHub uh, page. Uh, you can find uh, the Spring Initializer and, of course, the Spring Cloud. And, of course, also Scala and Akka on the web. And uh, that's it. So, uh, do you have any questions? Thanks. <laughs> yes? Can you please show the contents of your go-to script? My go-to script? 